Less than two years ago, Asia and the world seemed poised for an economic recovery as the COVID-19 pandemic began to recede. Unfortunately, additional shocks unsettled the nascent recovery, hindering the progress that had been on the way. The Russian invasion of Ukraine and the increased cost of living crisis have shown that the socio-economic recovery is fragile. Halfway through the implementation period of the 2030 Development Agenda, developing Asia lags behind reaching a number of sustainable development goals. Among these goals is poverty reduction. The COVID-19 pandemic initially set back progress on reducing poverty in developing Asia by at least two years. Since then, the increased cost of living crisis has added to the pandemic's destructive impact. Higher cost of living usually hit poor people the hardest. As the latest key indicators report illustrates, this is not only because poor people have less income, but also because paradoxically, being poor is expensive. The poor pay extra to access many goods and services. For example, it's difficult for poor households to buy in bulk, resulting in quantity premiums. And many poor people live in places with higher transportation and infrastructure costs, which in turn raises the prices of goods and services. If not addressed, the increased cost of living crisis could worsen other development challenges. For instance, many poor people may be less able to invest in education or in other opportunities that can lead to long-term benefits. And some may be forced to switch to cheaper fuel sources that emit more carbon. So how can we address challenges of increased cost of living? Data analysis suggests that strengthening social protection systems, boosting agricultural development, investing more in financial infrastructure, leveraging innovation and making supply chains more efficient can help cut poverty premiums and expand opportunities for the poor. As Asia and the Pacific works to recover, reconnect and reform, the statistics and analysis in ADB's Key Indicators 2023 will support efforts to reinvigorate economies while minimizing poverty. With policies backed by high quality and timely statistics, we can achieve a society that is prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. Good day and welcome to the Asian Impact webinar of the Asian Development Bank. We're very happy to have this opportunity to present some of the key findings from our statistical flagship report, Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2023, which ADB just released today. We encourage all of you to take a closer look at the report, which is now available at adb.org. Arturo Martinez and Joseph Bulan from the Statistics and Data Innovation Unit of our research department will present evidence on how a poverty premium and penalty coupled with increased cost of living disproportionately affects the most vulnerable populations in developing Asia. After the presentation, our distinguished panelists will engage in a more in-depth discussion on the impact of the increased cost of living crisis. We will also discuss policies and strategies to alleviate the burden of poverty premiums, which is where poor people must pay more to access goods and services than average citizens. And of course, the aim is to foster more inclusive and sustainable development. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to Art and Seth to walk us through some of the key messages of the report. Thank you very much, Albert, and a pleasant morning to everyone. So the report shows how in 2022, socioeconomic landscape in many parts of the world, including Asia and the Pacific, was shaped by mixed forces of recovery, lingering impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, and other external factors that stall economic growth, including increased cost of living due to unforeseen spikes in prices of goods and services. So today we will discuss how we have fared with respect to the first sustainable development goal, which aims to eradicate all forms of poverty in the post-pandemic and increased cost of living context. We'll also zoom into how even during normal periods, there is evidence suggesting that living in poverty may be expensive due to premiums or penalty, including 
um, incurred by poor people where they pay more for accessing select goods and services. So hopefully the data and statistics to be presented will set the tone for our panel discussion later where our distinguished panelists will discuss what policymakers and development practitioners can do to amplify resilience of the most socioeconomically vulnerable um, populations and get back on track to achieve the sustainable development goals. We could start with how have we coped with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic and of course with the um, increased cost of living. Over the past six decades, developing Asia has undergone a significant transition from widespread poverty to general prosperity. And of course, with these developments, it's notable how living condition in the region has improved over time. When it comes to poverty reduction, our region is one of the best performers. Between 1990 to 2019, just before COVID-19 pandemic struck, for instance, developing Asia has managed to reduce the prevalence of extreme poverty to less than 5% from as high as almost 60% in 1990. Nonetheless, poverty remains a development challenge that needs to be addressed. So in fact, if we use the new international poverty lines, data suggests that there were more poor people than initially thought before the pandemic. Of course, COVID-19 happened and it pushed developing Asia into its first regional recession, economic recession in nearly 60 years, with millions of Asians driven into severe hardship. Previous estimates based on data available when the pandemic was unfolding suggested that it set back the region's progress on reducing extreme poverty by at least two years. However, as more data became available, it becomes more apparent that such number may have been underestimated. At the beginning of 2022, Asia and the world seemed poised for an economic recovery as the COVID-19 pandemic began to recede. Unfortunately, additional shocks unsettled our nascent recovery hindering the progress that had been underway. Cost of living pressures rose as prices of energy and food spiked as the year 2022 unfolded. And across the globe, a number of central banks and monetary authorities were prompted to raise interest rates to combat surging prices. In a way, this stole developing Asia's economic performance, which only managed to grow by 4.3% by the end of 2022, which was, low, which was lower than initial forecast suggested. Compared to pre-pandemic projections for the year 2022, the combined impact of lingering effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and inflationary pressures show 67.8 million more people living in extreme poverty in developing Asia last year. And there's also studies showing that in general, poor people are among the hardest hit when there are inflationary pressures. In fact, as they spend a substantial portion of their resources on basic items such as food and energy, even small movements in prices may significantly affect low-income households. On the other hand, even if we take increased cost of living out of the equation, there is paradoxical evidence suggesting that it is quite expensive to be poor as they may incur poverty premium where, as mentioned by Albert earlier, poor people pay more to get hold of select goods and access to some basic services. So take a look at um, the chart shown on the screen. So the first chart shows consumer price inflation for different income segments in select areas where disaggregated consumer price index uh, information are available. And we can see that lower income households experience faster inflation over the past decade in these areas. And there are several reasons why um, this happens. One possible explanation is that many poor people live in places with higher transportation costs and poorer infrastructure, which raise the prices of goods and services. There are also other ways how poverty premium may manifest. Um, the key indicators report alludes to some previous studies suggesting that um, for some food items, poor people pay prices that were about 20% higher than those paid by the general population. 
what may drive this trend, um, some of you may ask. Um, limited financial resources can lead to smaller purchases, which end up being more expensive in the long run. And financial constraints also make it difficult for poorer people to buy in bulk, which in turn result in higher prices due to quantity premiums. Another factor is the lack of time and resources, particularly in transportation, uh, which hinders poor individuals from accessing affordable and nutritious food options. For example, um, there are studies suggesting that low-income households in some areas prefer small sh local shops that offer food essentials at um, some prices. However, the per unit cost of these smaller quantities is significantly higher than larger quantities found in other markets. Additionally, poor individuals may lack adequate cooking and storage facilities, such as a fully equipped kitchen or sufficient space for food storage. And this rely, so naturally, they tend to gravitate to prepackaged or convenience food, um, but that, that those tend to be more expensive and less nutritious. So for example, what is shown on the screen now illustrates lower refrigerator ownership in poorer areas, and that limits um, people's ability to store food and increases the burden associated with food preparation. Aside from transportation costs, poor people also need to allocate their resources to other um, needs such as energy. So energy poverty is a term used to describe a situation in which indiv individuals or households lack the capacity to provide adequate heating or other essential energy services within their residences at affordable prices. One factor that could affect energy poverty is geographic location. So for example, there are studies suggesting that um, electricity is um, substantially more expensive in rural areas compared to urban areas. This figure, for example, um, shows also the price ratio of kerosene based on data collected from a poverty-specific survey and the, a general price survey. And so a ratio of exceeding one suggests that kerosene is more expensive for poor people. So due to high cost of electricity, households may use alternative sources of energy, such as natural gas, coal, firewood, and other forms of biomass. And there are um, studies suggesting that this uh, form of energy may not be quite beneficial um, in the long run. Poor people also often encounter higher costs when accessing financial services as well, due to limited access to traditional credit um, sources. They may be ineligible for bank loans or credit due to lack of collateral, credit history, or necessary documentation. Consequently, they may be prompted to turn to high-cost alternative lenders, like payday lenders, who may charge higher interest rates and fees, exacerbating their financial instability and poverty. While fintech innovation hold promise in expanding access to excluded groups, um, there is some evidence suggesting that a significant fintech gap still exists between the rich and poor, particularly in Asia compared to other regions. And this lack of affordable financial services poses a substantial barrier for poor individuals and families seeking to improve their financial standing. While poverty premium exam examples of poverty premium exist, there are also criticisms against the concept. So for example, some argue that addressing the issue of a poor mindset and the decision-making of poor people when it comes to money and purchases is more important. And they contend that poor individuals may prioritize non-essential items over necessities, leading to seemingly counterproductive economic behavior. However, proponents of poor economics explain that poor people are actually rational with money, but the higher opportunity costs they face um, because they have to focus on meeting basic needs limits their ability to invest in long-term investments like um, having providing resources for education, which in turn, um, that um, limitation perpetuates the cycle of poverty. Poverty can also impact mental bandwidth, leading to time discounting and risk aversion as immediate needs 
take precedence over long-term outcomes. So what can policymakers do to get back on track in achieving SDG 1 considering these development challenges? The answer to such question is more relevant than ever as we are at the halfway point of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. As the latest special edition of UN's SDG report notes, we are lagging behind a number of our SDG targets and therefore there is a need for a fundamental shift in commitment, solidarity, financing, and action as the word maneuvers its way back to a virtuous path of development. We have hope if we take action now. By 2030, medium-term growth projections suggest that our region can reduce prevalence of extreme poverty to about 1%. However, there will still be about 8% in moderate poverty and almost 29% in economic vulnerability, which still represent a significant chunk of our population um, in um, precarious conditions. While the current economic growth outlook looks much better at this point, eradication of poverty is not preordained. There's a need for cautious optimism as the region nav navigates um, current and long-term development cha challenges, including climate change. Strengthening socioeconomic resilience of poor people and other vulnerable people in navigating future crises should be an important element of poverty intervention programs. Across developing Asia, there is um, diversity in social protection system. And amidst this diversity, data show that a substantial number of economies expanded social protection coverage in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, as this figure illustrates. However, a number of economies in the region still have less than half of their population covered by at least one social protection uh, measure. And in general, what we saw during the pandemic is that economies that were more severely affected by it were those without strong social protection system. In the face of the cost of living crisis that emerged in 2022, a number of economies announced social protection and other related measures to counter inflation. Data presented in the key indicators report also allude to um, other policy um, consideration in addition to strengthening social protection system. So that includes um, broader rollout of new technologies and innovations, particularly in rural areas, to reduce costs and increase access to basic and essential services for remote communities, as that can potentially aid faster socioeconomic development and help reduce the poverty premium, particularly in rural areas where a substantial portion of poor people are found. Furthermore, financial inclusion has the potential to drive down poverty rates. Data presented in the key indicators report allude to progress in financial inclusion over the years. However, there's still a need to close the gap between men and women in a number of our economies. Investment in education is crucial too. As mentioned earlier, poverty can force individuals to prioritize meeting their basic needs over thinking about long-term outcomes, such as investing in education. And this suggests a larger role for government investment in education for poor people. There's also evidence to suggest that behavioral coaching sessions incorporated into wider poverty reduction initiatives may contribute to improved decision-making by poor people. Women may benefit um, significantly from coaching sessions on more efficient consumption patterns as more, uh, at some data show that women tend to have the final say in making household purchases, particularly daily purchases. So let me stop there. And I hope um, everyone can check the full report, the key indicators report, and we look forward to a very um, stimulating discussion that follows after this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Art, for summarizing the key findings of this year's key indicators report. This is really very insightful. And before I proceed, I just introduce myself quickly. My name is Grace Gayoso Pashon, or more known as Gayo, and I'll be your moderator for today. And right now, we are very fortunate that we have an exceptional lineup of panelists that can provide 
more depth and valuable insights to what we will be discussing today. And I would like to invite all of you who are watching right now to please do join in the discussion by typing in your questions or thoughts in the Q&A box. And I can see that there's some that were already putting in questions. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists. Joining us is Albert Park, the Chief Economist and Director General of ADB's Economic Research and Development Impact Department. Hello again, Albert. And the next we have Tasneem Mirza, an economist of UNDP's research and writing team for the Human Development Report and the Multi-Dimensional multi Poverty Index Report. Hello there, Tasneem. And also joining us is Edward Faber, currently, who currently serves as the country economist for Mongolia. Hi there, Edward. And last but not the least, we have with us Dr. Maliki, who is the Acting Deputy Minister for Population and Labor, Ministry of National Development Planning of Indonesia's BAPENAS. And again, I would like to reiterate, if you have any questions, just please do type, in in, type them in the chat box and we'll try as much as we can to answer those within the time limit that we have today. And to our panelists, just please jump in if you have any insights on to help our discussion for today. And while waiting for more questions to come in, let's now dive into this engaging and informa uh, informative session on this topic. So like what you have seen in the presentation, while the region has made um, lots of strides as the pandemic began to recede, it still faces a lot of socioeconomic challenges that needs to be addressed. And one of these challenge is this increasing cost of living, which actually poses more challenges for low-income individuals, families, and communities because they have a higher energy and food budget share, which are key drivers to this ongoing increased cost of living crisis. And also this actually um, exacerbate, this situa situation exacerbate the existing socioeconomic um, inequalities that are happening and also um, it's the one that hampers all the efforts for sustaining development. So to shed light on this, I would first like to ask the question to our panelists from Indonesia and Mongolia about their insight on how these countries have been um, coping with a higher than usual inflation environment. Probably Dr. Maliki would like to start. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, appreciate uh, for inviting us and it's my pleasure to join this discussion. And second, uh, we, we would like to congratulate, uh, con congratulate uh, to ADB who already launched the uh, key indicator for Asia and Pacific in 2022. So, uh, addressing what you uh, uh, said has been uh, raised, uh, that the COVID pandemic uh, has decreased uh, the income and purchasing power, as well as in Indonesian population, to Indonesian population too. You know, the raising food prices, and then coupled with uh, soaring energy prices, and starting to affect uh, the living costs. Uh, this is very burdensome, of course, uh, and especially for the poor and vulnerable, uh, whose income has not yet recovered from the pandemic's uh, effect. So according to our estimates, uh, based on our national survey uh, on those in the urban area, the consumption of those who are in the lowest uh, percentile has not yet uh, recovered. Uh, from uh, before pandemic 2019, so uh, we compare with the 2020. Uh, even in uh, at the rural area, uh, I mean, the growth is uh, but it is very slow. Uh, resulting that at the national level, those in the lowest percentile of the are covered. So the consumption growth is still slowing down, uh, while the top percentile growth is uh, already recovered. However, uh, as of March 2023, uh, we managed uh, to reduce the number of uh, poor people in Indonesia from 26.16 uh, million uh, in March 2022 uh, to 25.9 million. 
This is a uh, very modest uh, dec uh, declining. It's only like 260,000 uh, uh, people yeah. uh, recover from the pool. Uh, and this is very uh, far beyond our target, which is like 1.5 million per uh, annual. But of, uh, for the extreme poverty, uh, Indonesia is uh, managed to reach 2.40 uh, 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 by March 2022. Uh, and it is actually declined very, uh, very rapidly. But we we are still using. I think this is also the uh, the World Bank permit us to use the 1.9 uh, PPP become 1.12 uh, percent by March 2020. So uh, this is all the profile of our poor uh, profiles. Uh, the Indonesian government is always trying to uh, control the after effect of fuel prices adjustment and also reduce inflationary pressures including the food prices uh, by maintaining the balance between accelerating economic growth, uh, keeping inflation at a stable level, and improving the target uh, distribution of social protection uh, programs, which is really improving the accuracy of the targeting system. In 2022, uh, in 2020, uh, due to uh, lessons from the pandemic COVID, the president also instructed us to indicate the social economic social protection reform which includes like five uh, strategies. The first is uh, the transformation of our data. So we need to have like one uh, solid uh, integrated data by the blockchain socioeconomic registry, which cover 100% uh, of the population. We already have the data. Uh, I mean, at the first and initial stage, we already have like almost 90% of the population that uh, including their socioeconomic condition. It is, will be very helpful for us to, uh, to set the target uh, for more integrated programs. And then the second is the development of adaptive social protection. As you know that Indonesia is very uh, vulnerable to the structures and also the climate change as well the result uh, the, the of the South that we have to uh, increase the resilience of the community. Yeah? Uh, so then they can uh, 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 resilient uh, to the uh, And then the third is digital efficiency of this. And the fourth is the formation of the financial team. And fifth, the integration of the social protection and community employment programs. And this one, in all of this uh, social protection reform, is actually also uh, uh, part of the transformation uh, for us to have the long term planning uh, from uh, 2025 to 2045. So at the micro uh, level strategy, uh, we aim to enhance the socioeconomic conditions and resilience of the families and communities, particularly those who are poor as well as vulnerable groups such as elderly, people with disability, women, uh, children. Uh, and we include uh, three strategies that uh, we kind of like intensively uh, implement it uh, to you. First is providing uh, comprehensive social protection, including uh, uh, food, electricity, uh, well, I think uh, Dr. Maliki, there's some there's some technical problem. Uh, <laughs> we can't hear you very clearly. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. 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 So, Okay. So what uh, what uh, I what I've been hearing is that some of the coping mechanisms that Indonesia has done is having this social economic protection, also improving on digital technology, and also having these data needed for long term planning. Did I get that right, yes. Doctor Maliting? Yes, exactly. Yes, that, that's all. All right, and we would like also to um, hear insights from Edward Faber. Edward, how about Mongolia? Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I'll start with providing some uh, context on Mongolia. Mongolia is a $16.8 billion economy and um, a population of about 3.5 million and GDP per capita of $5,000 uh, per person. Uh, and the poverty rate here under the um, basic needs approach is 27.8% uh, uh, in, in 2020. Uh, Mongolia's economy is fairly narrow. It's dominated by the mineral sector um, its primary exports are gold, uh, coal, and copper, and its primary export destination is People's Republic of China, where about 80% of exports go. Uh, but this does leave Mongolia vulnerable to um, economic and commodity 
price fluctuations and external shocks. And we have seen Mongolia's economy kind of oscillate in the past through periods of boom and bust. Um, and bef before the pandemic, the prior prior period of, of uh, bust was in 2016, when we saw poverty jump from 22% to 30%. So um, in 2020 in Mongolia, the economy contracted by 4.6%. Uh, uh, and then we saw some recovery in, but it was very muted in 2021 by 1.6%. And as we went into 2022, uh, we had an additional external shock from Mongolia with um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and also uh, border closures with China due to the um, zero COVID policy. Um, so, but nevertheless, actually, the economy did recover later in the year, and we uh, posted a growth of 4.8%. So if we look at the inflationary kind of environment, uh, prior to COVID, inflation in Mongolia was running at about uh, 7%. Um, this was kind of double the level that we saw in developing Asia at that time. Uh, the growth at that time was uh, about 6 to 7% in Mongolia. Uh, which is only about one percentage point above above developing Asia. So Mongolia does have a has had a higher inflation rate in, in general. Um, as the pandemic hit, inflation dropped two point six percent. That was as kind of demand um, was was reduced, of course, in the economy. But then, as twenty as we came into twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, we saw inflation spike uh, thirteen point nine percent in twenty twenty one, and then by mid twenty twenty two, inflation had risen to sixteen point two percent. So um, the primary kind of drivers are, are more external. Uh, as I said, we had border closures with uh, People's Republic of China, which affected um, exports. And um, that meant less foreign currency coming into the uh, economy and that significantly affected the exchange rate. So at least half of Mongolia's inflation has been kind of attributed to exchange rate differences. Uh, then of course, we had the higher global commodity prices, food and energy prices, uh, driving inflation and, and Mongolia imports about 90% of its food. Uh, and then domestically, we also had uh, increased kind of fiscal stimulus. And if we look at food prices and transport uh, costs and health costs, they actually all exceeded uh, 20% um, in this in this period by mid 2022. Um, so yes, yeah, the poor, of course, that are affected most by this high inflation. Um, it's estimated that the poor spend 43% of their total income on uh, food in Mongolia compared to 32% uh, by the non-poor. And um, in fact, we've seen reaction here in Mongolia in, in, in December, there was protests uh, on the streets com with complaints of uh, high economic difficulties, inflation, people complaining about the price of staples such as, such as bread. Um, Government estimates show that uh, a 20 to 25 percent increase in the cost of basic needs can push an additional quarter of a million people below the poverty line, and that a 10 percent increase in in food prices can also add one percentage point to um, people aren't people living in poverty. An ADB estimate show that the uh, poorest 40 percent of households in Mongolia. Um, that real incomes for the, those people fell by 5.6% uh, in 2022. So we don't have a, a latest statistic on the overall poverty ratio in Mongolia, um, but we do have data on those living under $3.65 per day. Uh, this shows that um, prior to pandemic, there was 6.3% of Mongolian population living below $3.65. It jumped to 7.5% in 2020, and then it stayed at that level in 2021. And uh, it's thought that there's uh, been a slight recovery in 2022, but of course this also reflects the changes in, in, in GDP. And in employment, um, the labor force participation rate here in Mongolia is, is 61% uh, prior to the pandemic, and it dropped during the pandemic to 59%, and then further again to 57% in 2021. Uh, although again, we've seen some recovery and, and unemployment increased by a uh, one percentage point um, in 2021 to 7.8%. So in other words, the picture continued to get uh, worse. So uh, yeah, it's been a mixed picture. Um, we have seen you know, the economy start to pick up recently, uh, but inflationary pressures have been there. I think one critical thing I'll, I'll finish with is to mention about the government support. Um, government has provided significant uh, social um, support in Mongolia. 
In fact, uh, the key indicators show that 100% of population in Mongolia has some form of access to, to social support. Uh, social assistance and, and, and welfare transfers, in fact, totaled uh, 18% of GDP in 2022, which is almost half of the government's expenditure. And this has crept up significantly uh, over the uh, recent years. Before the pandemic, it was just 9.1%. Then it increased to 13.4% in 2020, 17% uh, in 2021, and, and again in 2022. And recently in Mongolia, we've also seen uh, as the economy has started to improve in, from the second half of 2022 and into 2023 with uh, increased coal exports, we've seen increased revenues come into the economy, uh, which is also, uh, and so as a response, we've also seen increased support from the government. Uh, we had a supplementary budget uh, recently, which increased expenditure by 3.1% of GDP, which was, uh, for example, providing uh, support for increased uh, wages of the civil service, uh, social um, pensions, and other and other kind of benefits. Although, of course, clearly there's also uh, inflationary pressures as well associated with this. I'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, so as we can see, both with uh, Mongolia and with Indonesia, there's some sort of social protection mechanism and social transfers, improvement in digital technology as part of their coping mechanism. Probably right now, I would like to ask both Albert and Tasnima about what is happening in the other parts of Asia Pacific and the other parts of the globe? How are the economies actually navigating this increased cost of living? Um, Tasnima, would you like to start? Thank you so much, um, Kayoso. Um, um, so really what has been described in today's uh, presentation and the report is that we in the world, we're living in a context of poly crisis. In just three years, we have seen a series of crises starting from the COVID pandemic to the war in Ukraine, as well as the Silicon Valley banking crisis. We have seen energy crises in different parts of the world, such as the ones in Sri Lanka or Bangladesh, and the supply chain constraints, which has then le led to this um, cost of living crisis and the high levels of inflation that we're seeing around the globe. Uh, in fact, globally, the inflation has increased to about 9%. And um, um, as a result, what has happened is real wages growth has, has declined. And this is the first time this has happened in the 21st century that the global real wage uh, growth has, has decreased. And this is uh, really eroding the purchasing power of, of low income households. Um, and as Art has described, this is uh, much more pressing for lower income households. Uh, first, because they spend a disproportionate amount of funds on uh, uh, essential goods and services such as housing, food, energy, um, transport, uh, but also um, they, there is a poverty premium, as explained, as well as in this case of the inflation, the prices of essential goods and services went up more than the price of non-essentials, so having a greater burden, uh, economic hardship on, on the poor. And this has also been most pressing for those uh, earning minimum wages. So if you look at the individual level, what, what has really been the impact of the crisis is that people are having to work longer hours. People are having to work harder, uh, taking up more side jobs uh, beyond their uh, usual employment, as well as uh, accepting more lower quality jobs. Um, the people have, families had to choose between paying their bills or spending the money on food. Uh, food insecurity has been on the rise, malnutrition has been on the rise, and this is most pressing in the Asia-Pacific uh, region, particularly in South Asia, as you know. So, um, and what has also happened is amidst this repeated waves of crisis, people are feeling less and less in control of their lives. So events that are happening further away from home are having a profound impact on their lives. And so uh, there's a sense of loss of agency, um, in the Human Development Office, we work on, uh, our work is based on Amartya Shin's capability approach. And here we talk about agency, which is the ability of people to live lives that they value and have reason to value. And uh, if we look at um, what has been happening, people are being affected by many external factors of which they have no control over, which is, for example, the cost of living crisis or a war happening somewhere or the pandemic and so forth. And so, uh, in our last human development report, we studied the context of uncertainty that we're living in and how that's unsettling people's lives around the world. 
Uh, we have looked across data globally and we see that there's a trend of rising anxiety in people. There is more stress uh, in people. There is a growing sense of sadness. And um, even before the pandemic, if you look at data on insecurity, six out of seven people in the world reported to feel insecure. And um, for the first time in the Human Development Report, we focused on a chapter on mental well-being and mental health. And that has really been uh, affected also during the crisis beyond the you know, obvious well-being impacts, which, are, which is on poverty, on health, um, as well as you know, the lasting impacts uh, on, on education. And then what has also uh, led from here is kind of a social uh, impact, the social unrest that this has led to. More and more people are losing trust in the government. There is stronger kind of uh, uh, support for uh, extreme parties, in many cases, far right parties. We've also seen polarization in people uh, among within, within country polarization. And this is making more difficult to work towards shared goals um, or issues that require collective action, such as climate change. So those have been some of the wider individual and social level impacts. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit by uh, finishing off on what governments around the world are doing to address this. Uh, one obvious uh, a, a reaction to the increased cost of living has been the tightening of monetary policy. This has happened across board in developed countries as well as developing countries. But then this also has implications, for example, when advanced economies are um, tightening their monetary policy, the higher interest rate then has impacts on developing part of the world, for example, triggering capital outflows or the depreciation of uh, exchange rates that we have seen in Asia Pacific, um, which then affects balance of payments as well as kind of uh, pressurizes further the debt sustainability issues. Uh, beyond the monetary policy, countries have also worked much more to push fiscal policy, such as in the form of cash handouts to the poor uh, to uh, to deal with the higher prices of food and essential goods. And we have heard uh, from uh, a few countries in the Asia Pacific. In Malaysia also, they have um, for the first time um, expected to spend a record of $17 billion in subsidies and cash uh, to reduce the effects of the rising prices. In um, Egypt, for example, there expanding their existing cash transfer uh, mechanisms and increasing their outreach to a half a billion, uh, a half a million more people, families. Uh, we have also seen this in Saudi Arabia and the UAE where they have doubled their social expenditure. So there's a lot of fiscal burden right now on the governments to kind of address this uh, crisis. In other parts we've seen to hold energy prices stable, governments have tried to support people to um, you know, consumers uh, to kind of moderate the uh, rise in energy prices. In Europe, particularly, governments have spent up to 0.7% of their GDP to support energy consumers and up to 2% of GDP in some countries, which is significant. Um, in other countries, they have also tried to uh, increase minimum wages. And we have seen this most aggressively in Turkey in Arge and Argentina, for example, where the minimum wage doubled between 2020 and 2023. Um, and also some countries in, uh, in, in the Asia Pacific, such as Malaysia, Pakistan, they've also increased tremendously the minimum wages. In the US, we have seen the government, Biden has a new program now to, for debt, student loan debt relief. So they're um, uh, supporting uh, individuals with large number of student loans and uh, providing relief in context of, of, of the rising costs and so forth. So there's a wide variety of mechanisms as, as governments have, and there's a lot we can learn from here. So I'll stop here. Right. Yeah, thank you, Tasneem. I think Albert, you'll be the one to answer this most asked questions here. Like people would really want to know the differences in how economies in Asia and the Pacific are responding to higher than usual inflation environment. But I know that our other panelists have said um, some of these. Would you like to add more? They're really interested to know about these differences. Well, a lot of very good points have been made, but let me just make a few points. First of all, in Asia, at least inflation has not been as bad as in other parts of the world. Um, for a number of reasons, and, and it differs, of course, across different subregions, um, partly because uh, the rice prices didn't go up as much as wheat and corn prices 
after the Russian war um, invasion of Ukraine. Um, that said, a lot of countries have been responding to higher energy prices, global energy prices and food prices with different types of policy responses. I was really uh, glad to hear about improved uh, you know, social protection efforts in uh, Indonesia and Mongolia. But my own reading is that you know, social protection expanded in response to the pandemic. But when commodity prices went up after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, more uh, governments responded by directly trying to subsidize prices to protect consumers from the high food and energy prices. Uh, and some countries even imposed export restrictions on commodities because they wanted to um, increase local supplies and, and reduce price pressures that way. And that's understandable. Uh, and it's very politically important to protect consumers from uh, high food and energy prices. It can destabilize governments. At the same time, both types of policy responses often are problematic. And the reason they're problematic, if you subsidize food or energy kind of in a across the board fashion, number one, it's very expensive for your government budget at a time when you know, there's huge scarcity in fiscal resources. And number two, actually, it turns out that oftentimes the rich actually still consume more of everything. Um, and so a lot of the benefits don't actually get targeted to the poor. So we've been really, you know, throughout the pandemic and the uh, inflation crisis been urging governments to try to take targeted approaches to really target benefits to the poor and, and do it in the form of income support as opposed to directly trying to influence prices. You know, if you subsidize prices, the other thing that happens is you encourage more consumption of these very socially expensive goods, which is not what, something that you actually want to do. Um, and then the other thing is for export restrictions, you know, this is the easy way to keep domestic prices lower. So if you prevent exports of weed or palm oil or whatever commodity, then obviously uh, that's going to increase local supply. It'll reduce prices slightly for your consumers. But what that does, it imposes huge costs on other countries because this is happening at a time of global shortage. And the countries that are hurting the most and really rely on the imports of these goods, they're going to see much higher prices if uh, these exports are being taken off the market from different countries. So again, uh, I think ADB and most multilateral organizations have been urging countries to try to avoid that as much as possible. I know India had weed export restrictions, but at least they provided some exceptions for exports to other poor countries, recognizing the need in those countries. So these are difficult issues, but I think those are also important uh, factors to keep in. Let me stop there. All right. Thanks, Albert. And I think it remains a fact that really the hardest hit are the poor people when it comes to this increased cost of living crisis. And there's another question here. Most people like this question is interesting. They would like to know, are there specific population groups who are more affected by higher inflation and what type of assistance did they receive from the government? I think I would uh, give this question to Dr. Maliki. Are there any specific population groups who are more affected by higher inflation? And what types of assistance did they receive from the government? Yeah, uh, if we uh, see uh, the, uh, the development of the early inflation uh, according to commodities, commodities uh, during uh, this uh, year, if we can see that uh, we have uh, higher inflation for rice, uh, for rice, yeah, and then for uh, flour and for some of the uh, dry fish commodities. That is mainly uh, the food that is consumed by uh, uh, poor or the lowest uh, kind of. Uh, so therefore, uh, uh, the, during the pandemic of it, uh, Indonesia government increased the benefit of the food subsidy, uh, the food uh, water subsidy uh, that uh, it provided uh, for the uh, almost like uh, <clears throat> low thirty percent of the uh, the food. Uh, so we provided uh, I think maybe around uh, twenty percent uh, increase uh, from before is around fifteen dollars uh, no ten dollars and then to uh, around twenty dollars yeah uh, during the pandemic COVID. and then we also uh, try to uh, make more uh, flexible on the other. Uh, 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 supply of the food yeah. and the choices of the food uh, because long, I mean, before that we have like uh, 
the, uh, the food choices, but now the, uh, the uh, family can choose some of this uh, food that are uh, suitable for them. But we are still like, encouraging them for uh, buy more balanced uh, nutritious uh, food. Uh, so that's uh, what we, uh, we, we did for this. Uh, All right. Thank you, Dr. Maliki. But are there specific population groups that you can identify that's hardest hit? by this increased cost of living? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we, we see that uh, from the incident uh, in the, especially at the places, yeah. so at the urban places, uh, the uh, incident grows, uh, it hits very hard for those who actually the lowest going down. Uh, so the growth of the uh, the growth of consumption of uh, those uh, uh, groups is uh, still not recovered uh, from the pandemic. Of okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maliki. So now let's broaden the discussion to also include um, medium term and long term impact, especially for the poor and the socio economic vulnerable population. I know Tasneem that you have been working on multi dimensional poverty. You have discussed a bit about this earlier, but could you share the reflections on this interaction between the lingering effects of pandemic, this increased cost of living crisis, together with other dimensions of well-being like education, healthcare, access to basic services? Are there any challenges you know, or disparities, disparities that emerge from these areas? And what measures can be taken to address this complex you know, issue and interaction of these, def di these different dimensions. Tasneem? Thank you so much, Gaya. So let me talk a little bit about the Multidimensional Poverty Index that uh, UNDP uh, develops along with the University of Oxford, as well as the Human Development Index that we produce here from the Human Development Report Office. So uh, if you look at the HDI, for example, since 1990, we have been measuring it for 30 years. It hasn't changed so much other than increasing slowly. But in context of the COVID or the cost of living crisis, it has uh, fallen uh, by a significant degree. So nine out of 10 countries saw a decline in the HDI for the first time, and it fell for two years in a row. And the HDI also measures uh, poverty in its multiple dimensions. So it looks into income per capita, it looks into education and health. And as we know, in context of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, all three dimensions of, of this has been impacted. Uh, some of the impacts of this are long lasting as for example, in the economy, we are saying that, you know, it's taking a very long time for the world economy to fully recover. Uh, the employment rates, the job gap rates are still very high and even so higher for countries, uh, low income countries, for example, that are uh, having debt crisis. Um, and if you also look at some of the long-term development trends, what has happened is if you look at the sustainable development goals, for example, we are right now at the midpoint of the SDGs, um, but unfortunately we are seeing some of these trends stalling or reversing. And this is true for 30% of the sustainable development goals that, that are stalling or reversing. And for another 50% of the sustainable development goals, the progress is inadequate uh, to meet the goals by 2030. So for example, if we look at hunger, so for hunger at the beginning of the century, uh, the number of people who are hungry was declining until the recession hit uh, in 2008, 2009, when it stopped declining, it became a flat curve. And in context of the COVID at the cost of living crisis, hunger is going back up. So in 2022, after the pandemic, um, 122 million more people were hungry than before in 2019, for example. The same is true of poverty numbers as we have been discussing and we're seeing in fact the largest setbacks in global poverty since the world war ii and uh poverty trends have reversed for the first time in two decades and this is true whichever measure of poverty you take whether it's the income poverty so you could take world banks uh, extreme poverty measure or the moderate income or you can look at the multi-dimensional poverty index which is what we measure to understand poverty in its multiple dimension in all cases they are uh, the rate of decline of poverty is, uh, is reduced. And in 2020, for example, 90 million people, more people were in poverty uh, than, before, than if the COVID-19 hadn't happened. And 
So what has happened is that we, there has been a major setback and this has changed the poverty trajectory going up to 2030. And um, it is estimated now that by 2030, 7% uh, of global population would be in extreme poverty. Um, and as a result, what would happen is only 30%, we would have reduced poverty by only 30% since 2015. So that is not having world poverty. So that's where we are. And as you know, inequality has also worsened. Um, we have seen um, for the first time in between country inequality has worsened because after the pandemic, what we're seeing is countries that are higher income versus lower income, it's taking longer for the lower and middle income countries to recover. So after one, two, three years down the pandemic, whereas the higher income countries have recovered, lower and middle income countries are taking longer to recover. And so we're seeing this divergence and going further, we're expecting to see more divergence. So the impact of inequality is expected to be quite large. And amidst of a lot of these global trends, we have the climate crisis, which is ongoing, right? So um, many of these long-term development trends are being affected as a result of this poly crisis. And um, these are the issues that needs to be considered. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasneem. There are still so many questions coming in. This is really a knowledge-filled discussion, but unfortunately, we have reached the 60-minute mark. So right now, I'll be giving an opportunity for the panelists to you know, give their final thoughts, like short final thoughts about this issue on increased cost of living crisis. Um, who wants to, Albert, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I just want to make a couple of, on the climate crisis. One thing that is important to keep in mind is that you know our modeling of uh, climate response suggests that it will likely, if it's done well, it's likely going to lead to higher food and energy prices because of the investments needed in new types of energy and changing land use for agriculture. So governments need to figure out ways to support the poor from these high prices, not just from the recent crises, but from these structural changes that are going to occur as we address the climate crisis. The other thing I want to emphasize is that uh, I think governments really need to take the public investment role seriously, because if they can improve infrastructure, they can reduce costs to remote areas. They provide good internet connections to remote areas, really play a public good role. This can do a lot to help, help the poor. Let me stop there. All right. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Edward? Final short words for our audience. So um, positively, we see some signs now that inflation is starting to come down. Um, but how can Mongolia kind of better weather these external shocks <laughs> in, in the future? Um, one, Mongolia has a long term plan to kind of diversify its economy. It's, co it's concentrated around the mineral sector at the moment. So what else can it do bid in the agricultural sector, going down the value chain, et cetera? And the other point is around um, fiscal discipline. So, I mean, when revenues increase, we see government expenditure increase. And it's, although on one hand, so I think the government has this, this challenge on the one hand of, of providing all the social support, but on the other hand, needing to maintain a level of fiscal discipline so that it can kind of prepare for, for future, future shocks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Tasneem, final words? So maybe I'll make two points. One is that we can't lose sight of the long-term goals as we, address the, as we address the short term goals. This is something Albert has already pointed and this uh, is true for whether we're dealing with the economy or the energy transformation that's needed and so forth. The second point that I want to make is that um, what we have learned from this is that we live in an interconnected world and many of the shocks that are happening are reaching the most remote parts of the world. And so we need to, now move forward towards some mechanisms to address some of these global ills. Think of global public goods or think of protection mechanisms, whether it's pandemic preparedness or financial crisis, so that uh, you know population around the world could be affected from some of these issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Maliki? Challenges in our poverty reduction is actually how we correctly the target groups and uh, how we can also integrate the program. So uh, this is our main challenge. And then therefore it is, I think, important for us in Indonesia especially uh, to establish like a more reliable data. And we are establishing the socioeconomic registry and also set up like a more dynamic targeting mechanisms. 
uh, therefore, I guess this is the one that uh, I'm very, uh, very uh, vulnerable to also the, uh, the inflation is such, uh, I mean, we also have to correct the targets for those uh, vulnerable groups such as elderly, people with disabilities, and also homeless. But to summarize, there is no single way to eradicate uh, the poverty. We must synergize the strategies from uh, providing assistance, basic services, infrastructures, as what Robert also said, empowering to uh, empowering them yeah, to live uh, more sustainable uh, by providing with skills and also the capacity and also access to credits. I think that's all. All right. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our panelists today. You have brought, you know, depth and deeper understanding for us on this issue. And of course, to all of our audience right now, thank you for joining this lively discussion. And sorry if we are not able to answer all of your questions, but I'm sure you, you know, this index key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2023 report will be able to answer the questions that you have. So it provides a comprehensive analysis of the region's socioeconomic indicator. And before we leave, um, there will be an event again. So the next Asian Impact webinar will be tackling about survey insights on aging and retirement in Malaysia. This will be on September 8, 2023. It will be from 9 to 10 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. And again, let us continue to use evidence-based knowledge and collaborate across sectors to foster sustainable and equitable growth. Again, explore the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2023 report. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today and have a good day, everyone.